Welcome to the Love Lab Podcast, a safe place to get real about sex. Whether you're a man, woman, single, or couple, this is the show for you. We are your hosts, Kevin Anthony and Celine Remy, and we are here to guide you to go from good to amazing in the bedroom and beyond. All right, welcome back to the Love Lab Podcast. This is episode 101. That is 101. <laughs> <laughs> and it's titled, Your Ancestors Had Better Sex Than You and We Can Prove It. Okay, I have been wanting to do this episode for a long time. And it kind of started from a book, a book which I will be sharing from a lot today, that I was reading that was covering a lot of history stuff. And it's one of those books where they cover the stuff that you don't get in most of your regular textbooks. And it just had some hysterical, absolutely hysterical facts about sex in past history. So I thought it would be really fun to do a show on that. And of course, we did some more uh, research into this. And I'm, it is such a deep rabbit hole. We have so much for you today, and it's barely scratching the surface. <laughs> So um, how about telling our listeners what the book is uh, in case they like loving it and want more of it? Okay. So th And this book has way more than just sex stuff. But here, I'm showing it here. It's called The D-Textbook. And its, title, its subtitle is The Stuff You Didn't Know About the Stuff You Thought You Knew. <laughs> so basically, what they're doing is going through a lot of historical stuff that you think you know correctly because, you know, you've learned it in school, right? Mm -hmm. And showing you that what you learned wasn't really quite right. Well, I'm really excited to uh, dive into this because I have to be honest, you're the one who put all of this together mostly and um, I'm expecting to be laughing a lot. So before we get started, uh, let's give a big shout out to our sponsors, Power and Mastery. So if you want to join the secret club of men who are great in bed, then check out Power and Mastery. It is the most complete sexual mastery training for men. Whether you want to have harder, stronger erection, last longer in the bedroom, or simply increase your sexual skills, there is something for you at powerandmastery.com. All right. So <laughs> before we dive into how, just how kinky, history was <laughs> i have a quote here um it's uh, author philip larkin famously announced that sexual intercourse began in 1963 between the end of the chatterley ban and the beatles first lp so you know the reason i put that in there at the beginning of the show is because i think a lot of people have this idea that sex was pretty much only for procreation in the past and that it wasn't really until the sexual revolution in the 60s that people started opening up and that's where some of the more risque sexual practices came from. And so you really have to ask yourself this question. This goes with anything that, that you think you know about. Is, is that really true? And I can tell you that is absolute fucking nonsense and we are going to take the rest of the show to prove it to you just how messed up kinky sexy and everything you might even learn something <laughs> <laughs> You know, one of the reasons that uh, people think that way is because most of the past sexuality has been removed from the textbook so that you would never know, know it. Or, you know, it's just been like polished a little bit. But as we will see uh, from like some of the very first books, there are seen in there. As a matter of fact, even the Bible has sex. That's right. Well, first of all, a, a big clue is... <laughs> That if you look at famous paintings, mm -hmm. there's sex all over the place. There's giant orgies all over the place. That, that, that's a little <laughs> bit of a clue. But for some reason, they decided to take all this stuff out of the textbooks. Oh, right? Where was it where we were visiting this museum and... Uh and uh, it was all about, it was all things from like Europe. And I was like, oh, let's go see this because, you know, we yeah, yeah. Europeans it, it are was kinky. The, it was right? the Getty in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. And they had a French exposition there. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, let's go see this. And the, all the statues had their penises cut off. Yeah. Every statue had its penis broken off. But I'll tell you, you know, long before I came across this book, I was somewhat fascinated by this subject because many years ago I was in Paris. And I was in the red light district of Paris, mm. actually on my way to, uh, I'm going to totally butcher this because I don't speak French very well, Montmartre. Oh, that's good. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so not far from there, I, we were walking around the city a lot and we had to walk through the red light district on our way there. 
And that's where I saw they had something called the Museum of Sex.、Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, we have to. We have <laughs> to go into the Museum of Sex. And we did. And I was fascinated by the old carved wooden dildos. There were literally chairs that had a dildo like carved into it. <laughs> there, there, was, there was black and white silent film porn that had everything from homosexuality in it to oral sex and everything else. And at that point in my life, I was like, oh my God, I had no idea they did that back then, right? <laughs> but, but as the authors of this book say, <laughs> they say, it turns out that 95% of history was fueled by mankind's urge to bang. And let me tell you, that is true. <laughs> so it's nothing new. Right. <laughs> so, do we go back to our Bible? Yes. All right. I'm going to read a passage from the Bible right now. <laughs> <laughs> So, one of the things this book says is that the, the, they, they call out what is a myth and what the truth is. And the myth is the Bible is all chaste lessons. Turn the other cheek, do unto others, quit coveting your neighbors, that kind of stuff. But the truth is, <laughs> there's also a lot of insane sex going down, presumably to make sure everyone keeps paying attention through the slow parts. <laughs> <laughs> what? So, what they're saying here is that there are actually a lot of sections. That、uh, are talking about sex. So, in here, they're saying rather than using phrases like reverse frog squat, you know, or some other sex position, biblical sex is described almost exclusively as coming in unto. But once you get past the unimaginative verbs, the Bible has some nasty, nasty stories. Case in point Genesis 19 30 And a lot dwelt in the mountain. Oh, sorry. And Lot dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him. The firstborn said to the younger, Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drunk wine. <laughs> and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. They give other examples too about.、Um, This is incest. Yeah, This yes, is it, well, okay, aside from the fact that it's incest, it's <laughs> sex. That's the point, right? <laughs> Yet she became more and more promiscuous as she recalled the days of her youth when she was a prostitute in Egypt. There she lusted after her lovers whose genitals were like those of a donkey and whose <laughs> emission was like that of horses. That's from Ezekiel 23 19 20. Okay. So, <laughs> see, I knew you were going to laugh a lot during this episode. So, here you go. People are thinking that. Sex is a modern invention. We're already going back to the Bible and we're pointing out that there w a s all kinds of sex stuff in the Bible. And nasty things too, things that shouldn't exist, as a matter of fact. If you think that perversion has only come now, but I think it's been going on for many, many, many centuries. Oh, yes. And so <laughs> <laughs> I found actually a really good article too in The Independent, and it was called A Brief Cultural History of Sex.、Mm. And so they kind of went through some major time periods. Uh, and then they, they talked about what it was like during those time periods. And I'm going to supplement those time periods with some other stuff、uh, that comes from the book here, like when we get to the Victorians and the type of stuff they were up to. <laughs> <laughs> the prude Victorians? Yeah, exactly. The fa- as the book says, the famously prudish Victorian people were freaky as hell. <laughs> well, well, we'll get there. We got some other things to cover first. So. Let's start with the Greeks, and this comes from the Independent article. Aphrodisiac eroticism, homosexuality, narcissism, nymphomania, pederasty, and all those terms derived from the language of ancient Greece, which tells you something about its society. <laughs> If they had words for all of these things, <laughs> then obviously all of these things were happening. <laughs> things such as the myths of Homer and Plutarch told stories such. As that of Aphrodite, goddess of sexual intercourse, who emerged from the foaming semen of her father's castrated testicles. <laughs> then, then, then there were the mortal heroes such as Hercules, who it is said ravished 50 virgins in a single night,、oh. but who also had an affair with his nephew,、uh, Lolaeus, and fell in love with sweet Hylas. He of the curling locks. So, you know, he had affairs with young boys and he also、uh, ravished 50 virgins in a single night. What a stud. What a stud. Well, he was Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Hercules is the like, stereotypical stud, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
there's a whole bunch of stuff in here about uh, pedophilia and adult men having adolescent boys serve as their lovers. I don't really want to go into that too much, especially since it's way too current a topic these days. But just so you know, apparently that happened a lot back then. Um, then let's see. <laughs> then neglected wives found ways to satisfy their desires. Lesbians <laughs> certainly existed. And the cultures associated most particularly with the island of Lesbos mm-hmm. were... <laughs> Where burning Sappho loved and sung, <laughs> there are also plenty of literary references to the use of dildos, which in ancient Greece were made of padded leather and anointed with olive oil before use. Wait till we get to, uh, yeah, the, I think it was the Victorians again in dildos. Yes, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> I'm kind of interested about this island of Lesbos. Like, mm, I want to take a little... Should we take a vacation? Oh, sorry, you not have you, you can't get there. Oh, there's got to be at least a few buys in there. <laughs> 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 uh, well, what I do love, though, is, is a point that I want to bring is that I do think that homosexuality heterosexuality and as well as perverted sexual behaviors have existed since its origin pretty much and a sexual orientation whether you're homosexual or heterosexual monogamous or polyamorous it, it really doesn't matter as long as you are with a consenting person however when there's an age difference and you're abusing children i do i draw the line at that obviously um but I do want to say that it also is an interesting concept because I've always felt as a woman that we are naturally drawn to being more bisexual or bisexual, that it's just natural. Um, and I think that men back then were more in touch with that part of themselves. I don't know exactly what happened because when you read all of this, it was very normal for guys to have um, lover boys or, or, or younger men and I think somewhere along history it became a, a big taboo that men with men you know uh, but it's just fascinating anyway so you, you said Polly and that's a perfect segue into the Romans <laughs> let's talk about those Romans for a minute <laughs> probably the first thing you're thinking about are orgies <laughs> <laughs> exactly I mean there's there's tons of stuff in here about the Romans but uh, let's see. Despite this, the orgiastic culture of legend certainly existed during the Bacchanalian festivals, which all restraint was abandoned. Such, uh, such was the hedonism and lawlessness of these rites, with rampant couplings of both heterosexual and homosexual nature. The public worship of Bacchus was finally outlawed in 186 BCE. Prostitution was widespread and legal. The Greek tradition of they call it pederasty, it's pedophilia basically, it was significant enough to cause concern when the Roman birth rate dropped. <laughs> uh, Pliny, uh, we've probably heard of Pliny, I think he was Pliny the Elder, if I recall. Or Pl- he was Pliny the something, I don't even remember. Uh, yeah, I can't remember. Anyway, he recommended uh, mouse dung applied in the form of a liniment or pigeon droppings mixed with oil and wine. <laughs> Where do you put that exactly? <laughs> Uh, let's see. Much more successful was the method devised by gynecologist Serranus of Ephesus, who suggested a wool plug in the uterus impregnated with gummy substances. So, so these were these were forms of birth control. Actually, they were the the some of the original contraception. So, so you were you were putting mouse dung in your vagina, basically. Fascinating. <laughs> so, like as a spermicide, basically. Yeah. No, that that's that's exactly what it was. It was it was basically a spermicide. So interesting that they already had a connection that um, sex intercourse would lead to having baby uh, and you didn't want to have babies all the time, So, but you still wanted to have sex. So then you had to become very creative. Exactly. And that's one of the things. So wait till we get to what they made condoms out of in the <laughs> Middle Ages. Okay. <laughs> Stay tuned for that one. But what I think is, is sort of the point of all this is that it really goes to show that none of this stuff is new. Mm-hmm. Condoms aren't a new thing developed, you know, in the last 40 years. And, and, and you know, sex for the fun of it isn't something new, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, homosexuality isn't something new. Like, this stuff has all been around since the beginning of time. So something that I find also fascinating, and it's just coming, is literally 
we went through like sexual revolution where people were like reclaiming who they were sexually probably what what would you say like 60s or something like that 70s I mean yeah that's what the modern world basically yeah. sees that the 60s was that sort yeah. of sexual revolution absolutely time. but what I'm seeing is now we're in 2020 2020 and we are in need again of a sexual revolution where people get back to having sex claiming it and doing it more often and we'll give you some numbers later during the show uh, but it makes me ponder could it be that we are just only repeating this over and over throughout history where there's a liberation a sexual liberation that happens and then there's a little bit of a prudeness or like shying back away from that and then again uh, you go that back into pendulum more, swinging yes. from one end to the other end yeah mm -hmm. and you know what it goes to show is that what's acceptable really has more to do with your culture than anything else. Mm -hmm. So what time period do you live in and what culture do you live in? Because things have really oscillated back and forth from crazy, just anything goes type of sexuality to extremely rigid, nothing really goes sexuality, which again is another perfect segue <laughs> into <laughs> the Christianity years. Mm. So according to Ray Tannehill's book, Sex in History, the years between 400 A.D. and 1000 A.D. saw Christian morality gain a grip on Western thought, so paralyzing that it is only now beginning to relax. A lot of apparently the rules regarding sex originate in the Hebrew law of the Old Testament and were fixed firm for over 1,500 years. Firm. Firm rules. Not that firm. Trust me, they weren't having no. too much sex. <laughs> I was just imagining firm penises, really. That's oh, why I, kept I know. Saying firm, firm. <laughs> <laughs> but they, uh, you know, they made all kinds of stuff: incest, masturbation, oral sex, anal sex, homosexuality, all deemed sinful and punishable by the Christian Church with increasing severity. Mm. So there was a big crackdown during this particular time mm -hmm. on sex. Mm -hmm. Uh, and some of that stuff still exists to this day. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's probably one of the biggest things that we deal with where there's people coming and saying like, how was raised certain religion and there's still so much trauma and I want to be more in tune with my body and sexuality. And so we have to go back into some work around that. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the I will also say that, you know, this Christian error, uh, you know, it lasted for a long time, but it wasn't always quite... That's strict. Mm -hmm. For instance, the Middle Ages, everybody associates the Middle Ages with, with crusades, right? Mm -hmm. the Christian crusades, running around, conquering for God, you know, that, that sort of thing. But in the Middle Ages, <clears throat> there's actually um, uh, use of condoms. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mentioned that before. Mm -hmm. so, so condoms back then apparently consisted of animal bladders and intestines tied with twine and were reused many times. It appears they were used more as a way of preventing venereal diseases such as syphilis. <laughs> Later versions of the condoms were made with linen. The first contraceptive use of the condom was not until the mid-1600s. But still, they were using it to prevent venereal disease in the Middle Ages. And then contraception in the 1600s i'm just having all these thoughts of like okay they're reusable do they like pass them around or do you have one of oh, your i own? hope they wash them <laughs> <laughs> i hope they wash them before they use them <laughs> yeah but but what's funny is even modern condoms i mean nowadays they're they're pretty much all um you know latex or mm -hmm. or whatever but it was common not that many years ago to have sheep skin that's true yeah right so that's not all that unusual so that's going back to the middle middle ages right yeah and oh but check this out we're not done with the middle ages yet because <laughs> women also used contraception <laughs> they used concoctions of a variety of ingredients that acted as a kind of spermicide they were implied inside the vagina mm -hmm. one they were called uh pes pessaries and one pessary recipe consisted of ground dates acacia bark and a touch of honey mixed into a moist paste. The wool or cloth was then soaked with this mixture and inserted inside the vagina. I'm so curious, like, did it work? And like, what was in there? You know, like, I would be more, like if I read it had some like herbs or, or, or things that you do know, uh, or if they use castor oil, you know, because castor oil is kind of a natural spermicide, but I'm like, dates and honey? I don't know about acacia. Maybe that's where there's something special in the bark of the acacia. 
Anyway, well, if, Could it, be. if it works for them, that's wonderful. So I guess next we're going to go to our Renaissance pleasure. But before that, we want to invite you to our Platinum program. If you are longing for deeper levels of sexuality coupled with emotional intimacy, spirituality, and just true connection, then our Sexual Power and Passion VIP program is for you. This next level intimacy coaching for Modern Couple is designed to help you bring the passion back between the sheets and beyond this 90-day program is truly for the couple that does not want to live a life of average and wants to be synced up sexually so that they can thrive with more purpose and passion in life to help to learn more about our platinum program go to celineremy.com forward slash passion all right so yes we are now at the renaissance <laughs> and i thought it would be great to start the renaissance period <clears throat> by letting everybody know that according to the Old English Dictionary, that's when the first uh, use of the term dildo appears, apparently, in the mm. dictionary. <laughs> so it says, the word dildo was not actually used until the Renaissance period, according to the Oxford English Dictionary. But one fanciful explanation of its origin was a small, elongated loaf of bread flavored with dill, thus the dill dough. <laughs> I have no idea if that's true, honestly, but literally that's what it said in this article. So it's possible. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> you know, I'm laughing. I mean, full disclosure, it's going to be on the air. I'm going to say it. I've had sex with, I think I had a carrot once. So, you know, why not a dildo, you know? Hey, you know, why? yeah, why not? It's probably better than like a hard piece of wood getting splinters and stuff. Well, and I've used cucumber, but not really for masturbation. But when you peel off the cucumber, um, it supposedly like helps to cleanse the vagina and tighten it and stuff. So I was using like a peeled cucumber in and oh, so out. So a is little that bit. like when you put cucumber slices on your eyes? You yeah. Know? It's the same thing. <laughs> Apparently it works for your vagina. So I tried <laughs> it a few times, you know. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> 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 All right, so so back to the Renaissance here. <laughs> the article said, <clears throat> The spread of syphilis to epidemic proportions across Europe in the 16th century reveals that many men and women were not as chaste as the church <laughs> would have liked. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> Unfortunately, back then you died of syphilis. You right? could, yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's see, prostitution was large-scale across the continent. There were 7,000 public women in Rome in 1490, and the brothels of Southwark in London were notorious. Hmm. So, yeah, a whole lot of sex happening there. Uh, let's see. I mean, it is called the oldest profession in the world, too, when it comes <laughs> right? to prostitution, and it's... It's for a reason. It's been around for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of other stuff that was happening. Uh, the act of buggery was introduced for the first time in 1533. What the heck is buggery? That made sodomy between men punishable by death. So just anal sex? Yeah, anal sex between two guys. Okay. They called it Why buggery. didn't they punish like anal sex with a little boy? Because who cares about uh, two men? Well, hey, I don't know. That's just what they did back then. All right. They had it wrong. <laughs> All right. Let's jump into the Victorians because the Victorians are very interesting people. Now, I'm going to switch back over to my book here, <laughs> right? The D textbook here. And it says, <clears throat> the famously prudish Victorian people. The myth, the Victorian era was a time when porn was... A woman showing her ankle. Oh, wait, so like that's definitely the idea people have. Yeah. Okay. Well, according to the book here, the truth. Oh, it's true that Victorians weren't exactly into halter tops and assless pants <laughs> in public. In private, they made up for it by producing extraordinary amounts of porn. And not just any porn, but the nasty stuff. We're talking incest, rape, pedophilia, orgies, BDSM, you name it. Oh, but I thought BDSM only got popular when Fifty Shades of Grey <laughs> came out, right? Isn't that, isn't that when BDSM was invented? <laughs> I thought no. so. No? No. We're talking about it in the Victorian's time. Okay, I'm going to read a piece published in 1907, Memoirs of a Young Rack... 
what is that? Ray, Ray Kill? I don't know. Anyway, <clears throat> her dark pubic hair, I noticed, climbed all the way up to her navel. Her nipples were set in a small field of light brown hair. Lifting her breasts, I saw that she also had some, sort, some short, fine black hairs underneath. The sight of all this healthy fleece caused John Thomas to harden even more. I ripped off my nightshirt and straddled the lovely creature whose rhythmic movements set my pickle slapping back and forth against her belly. <laughs> Seriously, I mean... <laughs> I have to say, this is the first time that Kevin's reading porn out loud or erotica, and I'm kind of enjoying it. You're getting turned... Oh. I am. Well, you might... You might... <laughs> You will not get as turned on when I read to you a song Mozart wrote. Mo yes, that Mozart. The same Mozart. All right, the myth. Classical composers almost never composed works about ass to mouth. <laughs> the truth. The same genius who wrote Piano Concerto Number no. 24 in C minor also wrote this. And we are not kidding. Let me read you the amazingly poetic lyrics of this song. Lick my ass nicely. Lick it nice and clean. Nice and clean, lick my ass. That's a greasy desire. Nicely buttered. Like the licking of roast meat, my daily activity. Three will lick more than two. Come on, just try it. And lick, lick, lick. Everybody licks, lick his own ass himself. <laughs> so, you know, apparently Mozart had quite a sense of humor and he wrote this as a joke. Uh, which is probably why you've never heard of it before. <laughs> but he actually did write this, and these were things that they would do sort of in private, just mm -hmm. laughing and joking with themselves. <laughs> but it do goes to show, you know, what kind of stuff they were into. You know, <laughs> what what were they doing? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you, hadn't, you hadn't read that part yet. Oh, I was just trying not to laugh too hard. I'm thinking this is this is a crazy episode. Thanks for bearing with us. You know, we're hoping you're getting as much laughter as we are out of it. All right. So we're still in the Victorian era, by the way. Really? Oh, this war? oh yes. So again, you know, th these, these pure Victorians here. So it, it said in... 1839 in London, a city of 2 million inhabitants, there were estimated to be around 80,000 prostitutes. Oh, wow. 80,000. Wow. That is a big number. Mm-hmm. I hope they were paid well. I hope so, too, because apparently venereal disease was rife and syphilis spread wildly between <laughs> prostitutes, their clients, and their clients' families. <laughs> <laughs> including apparently Winston Churchill's father. Mm. Lovely. But so so then this gets even more interesting. So thus clean virgins became a highly desirable commodity, although faking it was so easy that by the 1880s the price had dropped from 100 earlier in the century to just $5 a session. <laughs> so in other words, if you if you claimed that you were a clean virgin, you could command $100. Wow, that back must have then. been a lot back then. Yeah, but how could anybody tell? They just, I know. They just did a little marketing and it was like everybody started to figure it out. Like, wow, I'm only going to pay five bucks for that because who knows? <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's fascinating. <clears throat> so let's get a little bit closer to nowadays. So we've seen now that there's nothing new when it comes to sex, that they've been at it for, well, since the beginning. I mean, honestly, we wouldn't be here if our ancestors hadn't been fucking and banging like crazy, right? For sure. Uh, but now we can acknowledge that they had a lot of fun apparently they explored their kinkiness there were times uh in history too where it was even supported encouraged and done um more in the open and then you went through times where maybe it was more hidden but it was still happening so i think it never really went down what about our beloved einstein well let's co that's closer to home now so what? let's look about einstein like wasn't he just like this physicist scientist very smart guy well Yes, but according to this book, when he wasn't sciencing the hell out of everything, Einstein spent his time postulating his wiener into as many women as possible, even though he was married twice, once to his cousin. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he cheated on both of his wives with about 10 different women. <laughs> hmm. Let's see. Uh, in his defense, he presented his first wife with a list of rules, one of which was expect neither intimacy nor fidelity. Fidelity. <laughs> 
<laughs> so wow. even Einstein, everybody's beloved, famous science geek, was pretty big into sex. Mm-hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> what about the Puritans? <laughs> the, come on now. I know you're listening to the show. You're going, come on, Kevin. You can't rip on the Puritans, right? What could you possibly say about the Puritans? I mean, the word itself says they're pure. <laughs> well, the myth is uh, every American school kid who has sat through a lesson on the history of Thanksgiving learned that the pilgrims who founded America were a group of sexually repressed religious fanatics known as Puritans. Okay, yeah. So what is the truth? <sighs> Do tell, Kevin. While sex between unmarried couples was theoretically a crime in Puritan society, that hardly slowed them down. It just meant that their society was rife with shotgun weddings. According to some studies, up to one in, th one in three Puritan women were pregnant before they got married. Yeah, not much has changed. <laughs> nope, it really hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> And you have one more example here you want to give us? That's well, okay. now we're getting into much more modern times. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this is the last one. It's a quiz. <laughs> so I have a question for you. I'm going to see if you can get it correct. <laughs> Which U.S. president nicknamed his penis Jumbo? And was found of showing it to people with the slightest provocation. Okay, so it's a multiple choice question. I'm going to give you three choices. A. Bill Clinton, B, Bill Clinton, <laughs> C, Bill Clinton. <laughs> You're probably thinking that it's Bill Clinton. <laughs> and you would be wrong. You would absolutely be wrong. No, actually, the answer was, drum roll, do -do 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 do <laughs> Lyndon B. Johnson. Apparently, Lyndon Johnson really loved his penis, and apparently it was quite large, and any time the topic came up, he would just whip it out and show it to everybody. Did, yeah. did he have a book about him as a dong-waving sex machine? <laughs> no, I think that was a little bit of Photoshop fun in this book here. Okay. <laughs> like, what is this? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it does say while other unfaithful presidents were satisfied with little affairs here and there, Johnson's bevy of babes was referred to by his male aides as a harem. Mm. Wow. All right. So, okay. So it's been, it's been going on for a long time. Oh, we have, yes. We have all of these people having sex. Um, but I started to dig in a little bit deeper because so now we are kind of like towards now time where people are like saying we are so free sexually and we can express ourselves we've gone such a long way because uh, things like being a homosexual is not accepted you can be in the open and even having multiple relationship and all of this and that got me to dive into some stats and some research and there was a study that that was a I was down on like a really big number of people. It was over like 26,000 adults that that were um, taken into account into that um, study. And um, the study uh, is called Declines in Sexual Frequency Among American Adults Between the Years of 1989 and 2014. Um, the gist of it is that it found that people are having sex less in general. It was also revised in 2017, so it's not that it's not that old, really. Um, and some of the things that they found is that American adults in the early 2010s report having sex about nine fewer times a year than those in the late 1990s. Okay, okay, it's just like nine times less a year, but when you think about it, it adds up. And then those born in the 1930s, the silent generation, having sex about six more times a year on average than those born in the 1990s. See, see this is shocking, right? Mm -hmm. Shocking to most people because how many people want to think, you know, like, you know, so my grandparents were actually born in the 20s, so a little bit before that. But most people, when they think about somebody born in the 30s, they're thinking, at least nowadays, about their grandparents. Mm -hmm. And... In their minds, there's no way their grandparents had more sex than they did. There's no way. They, like most young people probably think their grandparents didn't even know what sex is. Like, oh, they were so old fashioned. They don't know this, that. Or that. They were having more sex 
than the young generations mm-hmm. today. It's funny I'm smiling because my grandpa was born in 1933 and he is the person who introduced me to erotica novels he had a lot of like sexy pic- like novels and uh yeah that's the thing that he introduced me to only in europe would that happen <laughs> <laughs> but i wanted to bring this in because to kind of tie it into our um idea about this episode or title where we were saying your ancestors had better sex than you uh, what we're seeing is that nowadays people's priorities have changed back then they didn't have TVs they didn't have like iPhones and all these things to dist- distract us constantly they had more time they worked less they were less stressed and what do you see happen is when you work less when you have less stress when you have just more time you start to focus on the things that matter and for most people it comes comes down to their family, it comes down to their loved one, to making love, to creating a beautiful time or beautiful home for their family. And if there's one thing that you should take away from today's episode is, first of all, uh, there's nothing kinky about what you like sexually because it's all already been done. Yeah, somebody has been there and done that. You ain't that original. Exactly. So just embrace who you are sexually. But second of all, remember that your ancestors made time for sex it was an important part of their lives and they weren't just always like hiding it or not like putting it into its its place and so take some time to reconnect with the people you love make time to make love with your beloved have a weekly date night where this is the whole night is about making love because when you do this it it changes the quality of the life that you're living yeah, and you know, I would say you made a statement that, that they worked less. Mm-hmm. And probably some people are going, what are you kidding me? Like these people were slaves. They worked 24 hours around the clock. Actually, they did a study a while back and they determined that people in the feudal system, right? So, you know, you had lords and, and, and you had the common serfs. The serfs actually worked less hours a day than you do. Yeah. And Less hours a day than you do. And that's sad. We're all overworked. So it's time to like slow things down. And, you know, if that's one thing we've learned through this pandemic that we all went through is that it's okay to slow things down. <laughs> it's okay. Yep. So remember that and remember to have a lot of sex. Absolutely. Remember to have a lot of sex. Embrace whatever sexuality means to you and enjoy it. It's definitely a part of life. And like we said before, um, somebody has been there and done that. So, you know. Not that much of a big deal. Nope. (laughs) (laughs) All right, everybody. That's all the time we have for this show. We hope that you enjoyed it and we will see you next week. We hope you like this episode of the Love Lab podcast. If you enjoy this show, subscribe, leave us a review, and share it with your friends. And for more free, exclusive content, join us in the Passion Vault at CelineRemy.com forward slash vault. That's C-E-L-I-N-E-R-E-M-Y dot com forward slash vault. Thanks for listening. And remember, you're amazing.